Good afternoon, my name is Bettina Klein. I'm with NASA Communications, and welcome to this post-launch press conference talking about the in-flight abort of SpaceX's Crew Dragon, a, an important part of NASA's commercial crew program. Today with us, we have some great guests who will provide some remarks. First will be Jim Bridenstine, NASA Administrator, Elon Musk, Chief Engineer at SpaceX, Kathy Leaders, the Program Manager, at, uh, for commercial crew program at NASA, and astronauts Mike Hopkins and Victor Glover. They'll begin with, as I mentioned, opening remarks, and then we'll open it to questions from both the members, the media and the audience, and those who have called via the phone, and also social media. You can ask your questions on social media by using the hashtag AskNASA. With that, let's kick it off with Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Well, thank you, Bettina. Um, Another amazing milestone is complete uh, for our very soon-to-be um, project, which is launching American astronauts on American rockets from American soil for the first time since the retirement of the space shuttles. Uh, we're very grateful. Congratulations to SpaceX and the entire NASA team on this final major flight milestone that we needed to accomplish. Make no mistake, there's a lot left to do. Um, we have a, a number of um, parachute tests upcoming, and of course we're, we're going to get a lot of data from this particular test, and so um, we're not quite there yet, but uh, by all accounts this was a very successful test. And when we think about um, what we have done so far with the Crew Dragon, we've had a pad abort test that was successful, we've had now a, a high altitude abort test that has been successful. Um, on Demo-1, we launched, uh, we controlled the spacecraft, we docked to the International Space Station, we undocked, and then we had entry, descent, and landing. So um, this, is, uh, this is a program that is moving forward very fast, um, and we, uh, I personally want to give um, my strongest congratulations to the NASA team, which has been amazing, and of course the SpaceX team, which has also been amazing. So uh, congratulations to everybody involved, and um, I'll turn it over to uh, Elon. All right, well, I, let's see. I'd like to um, likewise uh, just uh, express a, a, um, a you know, great, great appreciation and admiration uh, for the uh, SpaceX and NASA teams that uh, made this happen. Um, with, without uh, a, a lot of dedicated people at SpaceX and NASA, this would not have happened. Um, so it's just uh, th thank you for your hard work and uh, dedication to achieving this, uh, the success of this mission. Um, there's, uh, you know, I think a few uh, uh, points that, that, are, that are kind of exciting to note uh, that the, the peak uh, velocity of, the, of, of Dragon during abort was uh, uh, more, than, more than double the speed of sound. It went to Mach 2.2 um, and achieved an altitude of 40 kilometers or 130,000 feet, 131,000 feet. So, uh, I think these are pretty exciting uh, uh, specs, you know, to be um, for the for the sport to have uh, gone more than three times the altitude of a of a typical airliner, um, and uh, you know, and, and and to accelerate that rapidly away from uh, a booster. And I think if you saw in the video that you know, the booster actually exploded uh, as, as as expected, um, so that was that was very exciting, and um, and the. It, it landed in uh, r relatively high uh, uh, winds out, out, uh, at the ocean level, which I think helps us envelope the mission for uh, when it is crewed, uh, since we, will, uh, we we expect this to be sort of a an enveloping condition for the uh, uh, winds at uh, sea level at the recovery site uh, for when when uh, crews are launched. 
So overall, it, um, as far as we can tell thus far, it is a picture-perfect mission. Uh, it went as well as, as well as one could possibly expect. And again, dedication. This, this is a reflection of the dedication of the hard work of the, the SpaceX NASA teams to achieve this goal. Um, yeah, obviously, I'm, I'm super fired up. This is great. You know, uh, it's really great. And um, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to the next step. And I think we'll we'll talk about more about next steps in, in uh, as we get further into comments. And uh, I'm super fired up too. This is really exciting. <laughs> um, you know, as we talked about uh, when we all got together, gosh, was it a couple of days ago? Um, we said this was going to be an exciting test. Um, uh, my boss told me, hey, don't talk about launch vehicle launches and exciting at the same time. But um, I think you guys saw today that it was a very exciting test. Um, I'm also super proud of the team. I, I really appreciate the comments from Jim and Elon. Uh, not only was it a NASA SpaceX team, it was a multi-agency, the FAA, the Air Force, the DET, everybody's out there, um, made sure that we had imagery assets and the ability to be able to accomplish this mission. And honestly, folks are out there right now recovering this, the spacecraft, which is going to be very, very critical for us. Um, we're super excited that it all went well. You know, we talked about needing to thread the needle with all the weather, um, and we did. <laughs> we did have to thread the needle. In fact, the needle was getting, the head, you know, the eye was getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and uh, um, uh, it, all this will be good data for us and, and for our crews that will be flying soon. So um, thank you, Elon, to your team. Fabulous job. Um, thank you to the NASA team. Fabulous job. and. Uh, Looking forward to the next steps. OK, I guess it's my turn. Uh, wow, what a day. <laughs> yeah, I um, also want to say it's very exciting to, to see this. Um, and uh, it's great to get to this major test milestone. Um, we appreciate certainly all of the hard work that the NASA and the SpaceX teams and, and everybody else that, that made this event happen. Uh, as crew members, um, our families, you can imagine, uh, we're, we're very interested in these escape systems and, and how well they work. And so we're going to be following very closely as the data comes in and, and we continue to an, uh, analyze it um, and, and see what that means. And in fact, uh, the work is ongoing, as was mentioned, the recovery operations. Uh, Bob and Doug, the DM2 crew, are actually taking this opportunity to, to follow those operations and uh, see what they can learn from that. Uh, because this is one of the first time, or one of the only times they'll have an opportunity to uh, to see those operations when it's not them. So uh, again, congratulations, and uh, we look forward to the next steps as well. Thank you. Yeah. And um, since my comments are the only thing between us and your questions, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, <laughs> First, to our families that are out there watching, a lot of them were very interested in this test for obvious reasons, and so far what we've seen is what we expected. So that's the first one. And then uh, to you all, the team that has helped make this happen, SpaceX, NASA, the Air Force, and all of the folks who worked so hard to get us to this point, from the crew, but also from our families, we want to say thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. We're going to now take questions from the media. We'll take a few questions here, and then we'll go to those that are have called in in social media. With that, we'll first start with Marsha. Um, Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. Um, Elon, Kathy told us the other day that you could carry crew as soon as March. Is that feasible, and when do you think the crew launch might be? Uh, well, you know, we were just talking about this in the green room, and uh, uh, I, my guess is the first question that will be asked is, <laughs> um, so uh, so we, we, we agreed on, on uh, response, um, so it's collectively, this is not, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, the, so the, uh, the, the hardware necessary for the first crude launch, uh, which we believe will be ready by the end of February. Um, However, there's still a lot of work once the hardware is ready to uh, just cross-check everything, quad triple check, quadruple check, uh, go over everything, everything again um, until this, and every, every stone has been turned over three or four times. Um, and, um, and, and there's also the, the, the schedule for getting to Space Station, so, uh, because Space Station has a lot, of, a lot of things going to it, so what's the right timing for this? Um, 
And the, the, the sort of collective wisdom at this point is that uh, um, we will, we, we, we think the, we're, we're, we're highly confident the hardware the hard will be ready in Q1, most likely in February, but no later than March. And that uh, we think it, it, it appears probable that uh, the, the first crude launch would occur in the second quarter. Oh, I, I think um, I think that's a, a very fair assessment. Um, I would also say we have to make some decisions on our end from a NASA perspective. Do we want that first crew um, to be a short duration, or do we want it to be a longer duration? If it's going to be a longer duration, then we have to um, have some additional training for our astronauts to actually uh, be prepared to do things on the International Space Station that we weren't planning to have that initial test crew um, necessarily do. Um, so we've got to look at look at that um, and and make a determination. Um, do we want that first crew to be longer duration, or do we want them to be a, a quick turnaround? Um, and those are those are decisions that we're going to be making in the coming weeks. But but as Elon said, there's a lot of just we have to understand all of the data. This was a test. Um, it looked beautiful. <laughs> we we all loved watching it. Um, but now the work begins uh, for evaluating everything that that we that we're going to learn on this test. looks um, at picture perfect, as, at, at least as far as we've seen thus far, but we need to uh, physically recover the spacecraft and, um, and, and confirm that there's not something that, uh, not an issue that, didn't, that perhaps didn't show up on telemetry. Yeah. Next question. Okay. Um, Chris Davenport. Hi, uh, Chris Davenport from the Washington Post. Uh, I guess for Elon and Jim, um, and I wonder if you chose this as the second question in your betting pool. If you could talk about how profound it would be and what it would mean to restore human spaceflight from U.S. soil. It seems like we're at a real turning point, and it's just that closer, what that would mean from both SpaceX perspective and from NASA's. Thank you. I'll let you go, Elon. Oh, okay, I was going to let you. <laughs> um, well, the, I, I think it's really uh, quite profound. Um, you know, I think uh, I think the United States is very much a nation of explorers, a distillation of the human spirit of exploration, and it's obviously something that appears appeals to to people with an, um, who are, have an adventurous. Um, you know, anyone who has an adventurous bone in their body uh, is is, is going to be very excited about this, um, and I think it uh, will help reinvigorate uh, interest in space. Um, it's remarkable to think that the last time that uh, a, a crude uh, uh, launch vehicle departed from the United States was, I believe, 2011 or thereabouts. So it's been almost a decade, which is remarkable. Um, and so I think it would be really quite, pr really, really profound to uh, have that, uh, you know, it's kind of for, for, for to, be, to be back in the saddle again and to be launching frequently with, uh, uh, with an astronaut crew. Um, I think it's uh, something that, that matters to, um, uh, all Americans and to, to people worldwide. And I, I would um, I would say certainly we are a hundred percent. We are a nation of explorers. We're also a nation of that leads, and um, this of course represents us returning American astronauts um, to space on American rockets from American soil. So this is a great opportunity for us to once again lead. And this time when we lead, we're doing it differently than we've ever done it before. Uh, NASA is going to be a customer. We're going to be one customer of many customers, and we want Elon to have lots of customers. Um, but, uh, but we also want to have numerous providers. Uh, we need dissimilar redundancy. You guys have heard me say this. I'm going to keep saying it. Um, we've had days in this country where we lost a space shuttle, and our space program was down for a period of years at a time. We need to make sure that we have redundancy in a way that, that, that doesn't happen again. And of course, if we look at what we've done with commercial resupply to the International Space Station, there's a perfect example of how sometimes when there is a setback, uh, we can continue to move forward because we have other solution sets to accomplish the objectives. So um, all of this is important for a very specific reason. Uh, we're on the cusp of commercializing low Earth orbit. I want to see large amounts of capital flowing into activities that include humans in space. Um, and those activities could be industrialized biomedicine, it could be advanced materials, and it could be uh, people that, that want to go to space for tourism, tourism pr purposes. But, but I will tell you this, there is a future where space is commercialized. And I also want to be clear that NASA, 
will always have a presence in low earth orbit. We are not, we are not, there's a lot, of, a lot left to learn. We are only on, on the, the beginning of what we're going to learn. So um, what does that mean? That means NASA is, is going to be a customer. Uh, we just want to make sure there are customers that are not just NASA. That drives down our costs. It increases our access. And it's not just for us, but for the entire world and for the private sector as well. Lauren, second row. Hi, Lauren Gresh with The Verge. Um, the explosion that happened today with the Falcon 9 looked really cool, but I'm curious to know what would happen if an explosion like that occurred while the Crew Dragon was still attached? The Crew Dragon was quite a bit away when it, it occurred, but is there any concern about that happening for if the crew's safety, and how quickly does that capsule move away in those first couple of seconds? Uh, sure. I, in principle, the system is designed to withstand a uh, sort of a first stage booster explosion that is, uh, or, or upper stage explosion that is uh, uh, there. That that happens when 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 basically even before the uh, the the escape event. So it's it's intended to be very robust uh, in principle. Um, so. Um, and the way you think of the the, the the rocket booster is it's less of an explosion than it is fire. So it's it's a, it's a fireball, um, but but it's much more a fireball than it is uh, an, an over overpressure event like an explosion. Um, and uh, you know since the, the the spacecraft has a very powerful uh, base heat shield and even leeward side heat shield, uh, it, it is it sh should be uh, really not significantly affected by a fireball. So it, 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 could, it, it could quite literally like something out of Star Wars fly right out of the fireball. Um, um, so that's, uh, obviously we want to avoid, avoid doing that, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, it, it, it is really meant to be something that can fly out of the fireball. Um, and, um, you know, there may, there may be a few points that are worth mentioning that, in, 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 you know, how is Dragon better than some, some uh, you know, what was done, say, during the Apollo era, um, the fact that the uh, launch board system is integrated with the spacecraft, um, w with the Super Draco uh, thrusters in the sidewall, means that uh, you have launch board capability all the way to orbit. Um, and whereas previously, uh, with the launch escape tower, that, uh, because it's so heavy, that is, that is discarded uh, often just, you know, 20 or 30 percent of the time into flight. So shortly, not, not long after uh, uh, liftoff, the typically launch escape tower, um, which is a sort of the historical architecture, w would be discarded. So you would lose the ability to abort after that point. Um, whereas Dragon has abort capability all the way to orbit. And then um, if you have a state change, anything that's a significant state change post liftoff is something to be concerned about. And not having to, to uh, to eject the launch escape tower, I think, is also an improvement in safety. So I think those two are uh, significant uh, steps in the right direction. Uh, there's also the, an improved ability for reusability. Since you're not throwing away the launch escape tower, you, you retain the, launch, the, the Super Draco thrusters. Um, that uh, you, you, now, you, you can now reuse that, the, the, the launch escape system with every flight. Because uh, it, it should hopefully be very rare that, that that the escape thrusters are are used, um, so that um, I think those three those three points are um, a meaningful uh, improvement over over designs in the past. Um, and then one one of the things we uh, obviously this requires um, on, uh, ongoing discussions with 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 NASA, but I think it would be quite quite cool to use the. Uh, the boats that we are using to catch the fairing, once that is is really well established, to catch the catch dragon as it's coming in from uh, from from orbit, um, and then that would uh, alleviate some of the constraints around a water landing, um, and um, but you know, that that's obviously it's, 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 there's some time before for making that happen, and we obviously need to recover uh, fairings reliably before we would consider trying to catch the uh, catch the dragon. Uh, but I think that would be also an improvement as opposed to landing in the water. And, and if I can just add one thing to what Elon's saying, you know, one of the most important things is that we, that we're monitoring the vehicle, the launch vehicle, to make sure that 
you're recognizing when the launch vehicle is having a problem so that the abort system is working, right? So we've spent a lot of time together talking about, you know, how does the spacecraft monitor the launch vehicle and then make sure that it's going to abort before it starts getting into those situations too, right? So all the things Elon's kind of like icing on the cake and additional, the spacecraft's robust, it can handle, you know, these kinds of situations, but, but more importantly, we're getting the crew away before you're, before the launch vehicle is in a position where you're having to expose the crew to the fireball, right? So the, and everything he said is absolutely accurate. There are huge advantages to integrating the launch abort system into, into the spacecraft itself. Um, and and that, those advantages are we can abort all the way, all the way out to almost space. Uh, the downside is it's, it's, it's engineeringly, it's a, it's a very difficult thing to achieve. And of course, we learned that back in April yeah. uh, when we had some, some oxidizer go into the pressurant system and resulted in a catastrophic loss. Um, but, but that's why we do these things. That's why we test. And because of the way we're acquiring this, we have very innovative partners that are uh, doing things that have never been done before with a purpose. The purpose is to ultimately save lives, drive down costs, and increase access to space. So all of these things are working. It, it is absolutely true that we will have setbacks as we learn these things. But it is also true that we are going to be better off for it. Um, and of course, what Kathy said is, is absolutely true as well. Um, you know, this spacecraft knows precisely where it is in space. Latitude, lo when I say space, I don't mean outer space, I just mean in space in general. Uh, latitude, longitude, altitude, yaw, pitch, roll, trajectory, velocity. It constantly knows where it's supposed to be and it knows what's happening to it. And so it can make a determination early, before the explosion were to happen, um, to, to, to execute the launch abort capability. So I think we're, I think we're where we need to be. Um, but it hasn't been without pain, uh, and, and going forward, we're going to be better for it. Great. Joey, second row. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, question for uh, Jim and Elon. Um, how, or first, Elon, will you be able to recover any of the Falcon 9 or its second stage? How badly you know, damaged was it when it hit the ocean? Uh -huh. um, and have you... <laughs> <laughs> there was a pretty tall plume of smoke, so I don't know. Um, and for future Crew Dragon missions, have you signed up any uh, private astronaut missions yet? Does this test kind of push forward any agreements with that? And for Bridenstine, uh, similarly, have you signed up any international partners? And what does this mission mean for that? Thanks. Well, it's, I, I, there's definitely not any big pieces of the rocket left. Um, if you saw something, there, there was a, a, a sort of object that was sort of falling. We, we think that's most likely the thrust structure of the first stage propulsion section, which is ex extra robust um, and has the, the engines in it. But it, that, that is going to hit the water hard and, and then be somewhere down at the bottom of the ocean. So. I, we're not expecting to recover anything. Um, in, in general, we would not expect to recover anything in a launch board scenario. Um, so that it seems quite unlikely. Um, yeah. uh, prior, I think um, we, we don't have any uh, um, anything to announce in that regard at this time. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I think we need more customers, is what I think. Um, yeah. But uh, so, but uh, on the international front, uh, you should know this: um, we have no shortage of partners that are wanting uh, to have access to space, and this is going to give not just us but them additional access to space. Um, we don't have any agreements at this point um, to ride on these vehicles, although we're going to have you know the International Space Station. You know, we've got 15 nations that operate it. We've had astronauts from 19 different nations, um, and we anticipate those partnerships all to go to go forward. And of course, they're going to be very excited about riding on a on a Falcon rocket and in a Crew Dragon. Yep. Great. We're going to take some questions from the reporters that are on the line. The first one is from Jackie Waddle, CNN. Jackie. Hey, folks. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, I wanted to check in about the parachutes. I know it's early, but were you pleased with how the Mark III parachutes performed today? And then with whatever testing that you still have ahead for the parachutes, 
Uh, what are you still hoping to determine? Kathy, why don't you so, I'm, so today was the second system level test. What we're viewing is a second system level test of the um, upgraded, what we call our Mark III chute design. Um, SpaceX has been doing a tremendous amount of testing over this last six months, I mean, um, and uh, really perfected the design, did a system level test in December, did another system level test, obviously today in a pretty stressing environment, and then we're working together to, to um, get a, a new set of flight chutes and do two more system level tests prior to um, our next crewed flight test. Um, working through that with um, SpaceX and looking forward to um, further learning and hopefully, you know, um, smooth parachute functioning on the next two system level tests. But we're very, very happy if you saw it today, um, flawless execution of the both the drogues and the mains, and both of those were the new system. And I would say from NASA's perspective, we are so grateful um, to SpaceX for stepping up to the plate in a major way to move forward with the Mark III parachutes. Um, there was a time uh, we looked at the safety factor from a Mark II to Mark III. Um, Mark II was good. Mark III was way better. Um, Elon and I had a conversation. I said, look, um, if, if we want to move forward quickly, let's, let's go with the Mark III and let's get as much testing as we can possibly get done between now and the day we launch crew. Um, and they move forward very quickly. Um, I don't know how many tests you've done at this point, but it's a lot with single shoots. And now we're up to the point where we're doing full system level tests with all four shoots. Um, and, um, and so far they're, they're looking good. So we're, we're grateful to the SpaceX team. I also want to say thank you to the Airborne team. Um, I've had a exactly. couple of conversations with the CEO of Airborne, told them what a high priority this is for our nation. Um, and they have, um, they've been working overtime to make sure these parachutes are, are developed and packed. And we're, we're grateful for their support as well. Yeah, I'd also like to say th thanks for the Airborne team. They've, they've been uh, essential in this. So this is an unprecedented amount of parachute testing, I think, that we've ever seen um, from a NASA perspective. So really great partnership across the NASA, SpaceX, and Airborne team. Our next question is from Tim Fahrenholz from Quartz. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, congratulations on the test today. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, if we could get some understanding of what the next couple of months look like from an analysis perspective. Uh, how many people at NASA are going to be working on certifying the Dragon and the Starliner eventually uh, for the crewed flight test? And how does that compare to the experience during the COTS program? Kathy? So, um, so I, I actually worked on both cargo and then now crew, right? And, and um, I'll tell you from a, a station perspective, which is what the cargo program was focused on, um, it's, it's consistent between obviously cargo and, and crew. What's different is, is that um, obviously crew's different and, the, and the, the certification requirements for crew are, are different. So um, I think even though we have a, a, a small program standpoint, um, I think we're probably about um, two to three times the amount of NASA folks um, that are working crew versus cargo, the certification aspect of cargo, which to me makes a lot of sense because cargo was really focused, the NASA certification aspect was just focused on making sure the vehicle um, could safely dock with station. For crew, obviously, we need to make sure we're certifying the ground systems, the operations, the launch vehicle, and the spacecraft. So obviously, that's kind of four times the amount of work that you had to do for cargo. So um, that, that's kind of sized appropriately to me. Okay. We'll take one more question from the phone, and then we'll go back into the room. And uh, next is Irene Klotz from Aviation Week. Um, my question is for Elon. Does this uh, launch, um, does this uh, in-flight abort test have any um, applications for programs beyond commercial crews, specifically for Starship? And also, does somebody have the exact uh, wind speed at the recovery site? Thank you. Okay. Uh, no, I don't, I don't think this has, it's, it's not directly relevant to Starship. Uh, um, 
as we do not expect to use uh, parachutes on Starship. Uh, albeit, like the 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 only reason Starship is happening is because of uh, the progress made uh, with uh, uh, you know essentially all the work done by by NASA and, and others before SpaceX even started and support that we've received um, after starting, um, without which Starship would not be possible. And I didn't catch the second question. Uh, wind speed touchdown. Uh, wind speed touchdown. I I believe was um, I, I I think uh, I, I think around twenty five to thirty feet per second. Uh, wind speed wind speed at touchdown was um, twenty seven knots. Yeah, oh, twenty seven knots. Yeah. Feet per second, sorry, feet 27 second. feet per second. Yeah. 17, so 17, yeah, 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 20, yeah, <laughs> seven, I'm sorry, 20 not, <laughs> that would have been a stressing test. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, it, uh, yeah, it, was, yeah. it, was, it was oscillating, but, but it's yeah. sort of in the high 20s. 13 yeah. to 18 knots, yeah. and I think we got like 27 uh, but feet per it, second. It provides a good envelope in case uh, for uh, crewed missions. Yeah. Okay. Our next question. you were beaming and so I really want to hear from you what it was like where did you watch from was it the control room was any of your family with you and what did you learn so uh, yeah we were in the uh, in the firing room um, and anytime you see a rocket launch is is very exciting and obviously the significance of, of this particular launch and the test uh, was was something that we were particularly interested in and, and to see that our families were not here with us. Uh, they were back home, but uh, I did receive a text from my wife right afterwards and, and said everything looked good from her perspective. So, um, so they're obviously very interested in it as, as well. And, uh, and again, every time I'm, I'm out here, uh, this is just a special place. And, and when you get to see these rockets launch, it, it just gives you goosebumps. And I'm getting goosebumps again right now. So no, the families weren't there. My wife also was uh, in touch via text message. And um, learning uh, that happened today, or maybe relearning or adding more context to the fact that we have an amazing team working through the issues with the weather and, the, and making sure that the vehicle, uh, both Fal Falcon and Dragon, were ready to launch. It was just impressive to be on the loops and listen to them disposition all of those things and, and make sure that we would have a test at all. So just getting to the point where we could launch, it was impressive to be there amongst the folks making it happen. Cricket. We're going to take a question from social media quickly. All right, I have a question from Ashley James Lee. She says, great test, well done. What would be the reason for the splashdown being earlier than expected on the timeline? It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't I, mater I, don't, I, don't, I thought it was pretty much right on target yeah, for what we were expecting. So. Um, obviously, we can go back and look at the data, but right now it's looking like things were pretty nominal. Yeah. Next question. Um, right here, third row. Thank you. Sawyer Rosenstein with Talking Space. Uh, so I know a lot of the focus is obviously going to be on the data from the Crew Dragon, but I was also wondering how much data you were able to get after the breakup of the uh, first stage, and if there's any plans to use that data for possible future mission parameters for crew or for range or anything like that? Uh, we lost telemetry on the first stage shortly after it exploded. From the breakup of the vehicle, that could possibly change design or engineering in the future of it. It's possible, but it's too early to say at this point. Gotcha. Okay. Third row, I'm sorry, on this side with the, the hat. Hi, I'm Jim Siegel. I'm with uh, NASA Tech, and I have a couple of questions. Well, actually, one question, I suppose, for the two astronauts. Um, I understand you went through kind of a dress rehearsal on Friday. Uh, so you uh, got a chance to get, in, get into the uh, capsule while it was atop the rocket. And I'm interested in what kinds of activities that you did while you were doing this. So what systems did you check out? Did you eat? Did you take a nap? What did you do? 
Right. So, so the dress rehearsal, actually, uh, Bob and Doug were the ones that participated in that as the DM2 crew. And essentially, it started from crew wake up all the way through um, being hand, his, listening to a weather brief and then getting handed over to SpaceX uh, at the suit up room. And so they were then able to uh, don their suits and go through that full process of checking the suits for, for leaks. And, and then from there, uh, walking out to the vehicles, getting in the convoy and going from our crew quarters over to the launch pad itself. And, uh, and then going up onto uh, the, the tower and walking out on the crew arm. They did not actually get into the vehicle because the vehicle um, you know, wasn't in a configuration for them to, to get strapped in or anything. And so that was the point where that dress rehearsal ended. Uh, the, a lot of that data was timeline type data that we were getting, you know, just making sure everything flowed together. The communication was good between all of the different team members. And uh, I, I think there was a, a lot of uh, lessons uh, learned that came out of it, and, uh, and, and people are making uh, adjustments as necessary based on what we saw. Anything else? Nope. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. Okay. Chris, over here in the second row. Chris Gebhardt with NASA Space Flight for Jim and Elon. Um, you, so you, you mentioned that the decision will be forthcoming in, in the next few weeks as to whether DM2 will be short duration or long duration. I'm wondering from NASA's side what, why that hasn't been decided yet this close to a particular launch, especially with the U.S. crew segment reducing down in size in the coming months. And from SpaceX's perspective, is there anything that would have to be done to the capsule at this point, depending on what that decision is? So the, you know, the, uh, by, by standard, uh, if we go with the plan as it currently stands, um, we would launch, uh, you know, DM2 as a short duration test flight. Um, and then we would have an operational flight test later uh, with our two astronauts here, and they would do a, a long-term, long-duration uh, flight. Um, so that's, that's one solution, and that's, that's where things stand as of right now. But we might look at making that first crew be a longer-duration uh, crew for the purpose of getting um, the maximum amount of capability out of the International Space Station uh, with having, basically, we'll be able to maintain a larger presence of astronauts on the space station for a longer period of time. Um, so there's, there's another, um, you know, competing interest here. Um, and, and in order to make, to make that happen, um, that first crew for DM-1, the, the test flight, would, that would need to be, that, that crew would need to be, need to go through some additional training for a longer duration flight to do activities on the International Space Station. It also gives us opportunities to do um, extravehicular activities that may not right now be scheduled, but may pop up uh, based on things that happen on the ISS. Um, and it's always better to have more crew on board for those activities rather than less. If we end up with one American on the International Space Station, then that American will be doing the EVA. Um, and, and we want to make sure that we give us the best chance of, of success. Now, I'm not saying that this is the direction we're going to go. Um, w we, we just haven't decided yet. Um, and, and we're, we're working through it. But we have, the good thing is, given what looks like to be a very successful test, we now have options. <laughs> so that's a positive thing. Uh, from a SpaceX standpoint, we'll make sure we're ready to serve whatever needs NASA may have. Um, and so whatever decision is made that we can support either. Yeah, thank you. And we've insured the vehicle. We've been working with SpaceX to insure the vehicle really has had the, the capability to be able to have a longer duration mission really over the last six, seven months, been working with SpaceX. Just, just like Jim said, you always need to have options when you're dealing with um, these types of missions. Okay. Emery in the fourth row. Hey, a uh, question for, for Elon. Uh, obviously, an abort scenario is a, a different kind of stress on the right. on the Very on the high stress, that's yeah true. i'm wondering if that impacts reusability do you get fewer flights out of a crew dragon in that scenario or <laughs> yeah. is that to be determined <laughs> i'm i'm not sure i i would we would really require a lot of a lot of thought and of course uh, um support from from nasa to refly and a, a dragon that went through an abort i hope this is such a rare event that it the circumstance never comes up I, I w I'll tell you one thing that impressed me. Um, you know, when we looked at the ballistic reentry um, that Nick Haig went through on a on a Soyuz rocket just a, a year ago, 
Um, you know, he was up around six and a half, almost seven G on that ballistic reentry. Now he was at a much higher altitude, but this entire launch abort sequence that we just saw, the highest G state was about three and a half Gs. Um, and then, and then when it was, you know, coming back, it, we're looking at like 2.3 G, which is, um, that's, that's impressive. Um, it, it, it looked like it would have been a, maybe a rough ride, but the data didn't bear that out. And, uh, you know, I think that gives our astronauts some confidence that um, that the ride might not be so bad if we have to execute one of these launch abort capabilities. Yeah, the, the launch cap abort capability is in principle up to, capable of up to sort of six, six or more Gs, but uh, it's it, it it limits the the uh, acceleration uh, to maximize the comfort of the or, or safety of the the astronauts. So it's that it's 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 reconfiguring depending upon. Uh, what what is what achieves the maximum probability of safety and minim minimizes injury? Next question to the writer. Hi, Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Um, can someone update us on the condition of the spacecraft after the splashdown? Has have the recovery teams got to it? Is it on the boat yet? And. <laughs> Um, <laughs> seats from Russia to get through the year or into next year, or, or is that still ongoing? So uh, at, the, at this point, as much confidence as we have in the team, I, I think it's probably not prudent to, um, to, to go that direction. We, I think it's important that we have um, options. Again, we want to increase our option space um, and make sure that the International Space Station has uh, continuous American presence. Um, and so we're not, we're not ready to make any adjustments on that front. We're going to buy another Soyuz seat. Uh, sorry, I, I, I was just looking to see if, if I'd received an update, but um, I think the uh, re recovery vessel is just is just securing it right now, so we do not have additional information t at this time. Question here, second row. Congratulations, uh, Robin from Supercluster. Have you flown the Dragon Simulator in Hawthorne, and have you tried on the suit multiple times? Um, I've tried. <laughs> um, I've, I've tried. I've tried. I've, uh, the, the, I've tried on the helmet. Um, and I've flown the uh, docking uh, simulator several times. Are you good at it? <laughs> you know. I'll I've tell you, I, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I, I nailed it. First time. And, of course, every time since. But you had Bob and Doug's help. I did. I know. <laughs> I think it's good. It's, 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 it's played a lot of, having played a lot of video games as a youth is probably helpful. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, it's the, the, the uh, Dragon actually approaches the space station very slowly, so it's um, uh, it, 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 it's 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 actually very much slower than people realizes realize. So so it, it's I think it, it's 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 not it's not very difficult to uh, dock with the space station because because it is approaching very slowly and you have very fine controls. In fact, you can adjust between. Uh, uh, Sort of course corrections and 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 fine control uh, corrections, so you can adjust the thrusters to uh, have uh, sort of nuanced effects or it's like broad brushstroke, fine brushstroke, um, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's 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 pretty straightforward to to dock in in light of that. Tim, Tim Dodd, the astronaut. Uh, question for pretty much anyone who can answer it. Uh, Elon, Kathy, uh, Jim, uh, the exact sequence of events today. It, it was kind of hard to tell, actually, when we're seeing the feed. And, of course, from the press site, we just saw a cloud. Uh, is it, was it the, an engine shutdown was the initial trigger? And then did the dragon, you know, was the, was the actual abort sequence? Was it the, the dragon was triggered to abort, and then, you know, the engine shut down after that? And then, you know, or was it, like, the shutdown of the engines? And then the, the sequence of events was actually kind of confusing and hard for us to figure out. And, of course, we didn't really see much. Can you actually run us through what exactly was programmed when and how it all triggered and what triggered what, I guess, this, the chain of events? Actually, I, I was thinking about posting the, the, the time sequence of events, of uh, what, what occurs in, in the course of about 700 milliseconds. Uh, it, it's a tr really a... M m 
way more than a human could do uh, is occurring in, in a fraction of a second. Uh, but the, the, the engines are, there's a command to the engines to shut down. Um, and, um, and then the uh, abort system uh, then, then presses up very rapidly. Uh, the uh, super breakers are are ignited. The uh, it, 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 it initiates separation from the um, uh, f from the upper stage, um, but all, all of this is occurring in in, in literally a split second. Um, and um, yeah, and, and the it's it's really quite remarkable how quickly those engines reach full thrust, um, and and all eight of them do, and and then it, it it's. Uh, it controls via um, differential thrust uh, of the the eight en of the eight super Draco engines, um, and so it's making those uh, th thrust adjustments um, at the you know almost the millisecond level. It's very very fast. Um, yeah. And then the engines will shut down after that. So yeah. 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 Then the launch vehicle, the the, sec the yeah first stage engines were all shut down at that stage. And so just to clarify, like the actual, I'm just trying to still figure out if it's like because the engine shut down that inherently triggered the abort, or no. was that all pre-planned and, as, and as hard part, sequence basically. As part of the abort sequence, like if, if the system detects that there's uh, the, the the things are severe enough to initiate an abort. In this case, we obviously we 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 um, we we. we we, we set the abort triggers to be super low, such that they would occur at, at a very specific um, sort of uh, velocity. Um, and uh, as part of the abort sequence, one of the things that's done is issue a command to the engines to shut down. Um, and, uh, but, you, but you don't wait for them to get fully shut down. You issue a command shutdown, um, and, and then, uh, uh, th then, then you pressurize the uh, abort system, the Super Draco abort system, uh, and 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 this, the, a lot of these things are happening in parallel. So you're not waiting for one thing to occur uh, after another. A lot, there, a lot of them are occurring in in, in parallel. Um, but it's saying sh shut down main engines, cut thrust, um, and then uh, if, if, uh, pressurize the abort system and 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 uh, fire up the abort system with, with all eight super dracos. Um, it's capable of working even if one of the super dracos do, uh, does not. Uh, Yes, so it's got engine out capability on the uh, abort system, um, and then, and then it, it, it's going, you know. So the remember what the goal is. The goal is to get as much separation from the booster as possible as soon as as soon as possible. And what we saw is it was uh, we got some data on this initially. It was uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was like a kilometer of distance between a mile, a mile of distance between the the booster and and uh, the dragon, and it was just in a matter of seconds that, that that separation was created. So that just shows you the capability, and, and all the while, never exceeding three and a half Gs. I mean, that's, that's really amazing. Yeah, it, it, even if it were, were to be the case that the, uh, the, the booster engines continued firing um, after the after shut down, shutdown command, uh, dragon has enough thrust to um, accelerate away from the booster at, at rapid, rap, very rapidly. Well, thank, thank you so much. This is going to conclude our press conference. Uh, I'd like to invite if our, any of our speakers have some closing remarks. I think we should have our astronauts say a few words. <laughs> uh, well, again, I'll just uh, reiterate today was a, a very important day for us in the, in the test program. And I think uh, for all of the astronauts, uh, we're very excited at, at what we've seen at, to this point, And we, we look forward to seeing the rest of the results. Um, and we look forward to um, our continuing preparations for Doug and Bob to launch and, and then uh, after that for, for Victor and I to, to go up. So we're, we're excited where we are right now. We're excited to continue training to uh, finish up the testing and, uh, and get ready for launch. Well said. Um, important step on a, a, on a long journey and we're looking forward to the data analysis and learning more uh, about the test today and the recovery efforts. Like I said, those are still going on. And, and um, yeah, we're grateful for all the hard work to get here and uh, looking forward to the work that we have to, left to do. Well, thank you all. For more information, you go to nasa.gov. Thanks. Have a great day.
three, two, one.